So today I'm going to be talking about the role that epigenetics plays in human health and disease. And I'm sure many of you, or most of you know, it's huge. In fact, from my, I'm somewhat biased, I think that once all is said and done, we'll find that the epigenome is playing more, a bigger role in disease susceptibility than the genome itself, even though obviously both of them are uh, important in this process. <clears throat> now I want to start out by asking a question. How many of you know identical twins? Anybody? Yeah, a lot of them. Whoa. It's amazing. Identical twins, right? <laughs> Can you tell the difference between the two of them? Some say yes, some say no. We have a neighbor across the way. There's a Duffer, the Duffer brothers who wrote uh, Stranger Things for Netflix. Lives right, their parents live right across the road. And the mother said she could tell one of the identical twins from the other just by the way they walked down the stairs, <laughs> their gait. So the question is, how can you tell the difference between identical twins, given that the DNA is comparable, basically, in both individuals? And one of the main reasons probably for this is that even though the genomes are basically identical, their epigenomes are not going to be identical. And you can say, well, how could that possibly be? So I've got here a painting that was done by Colin Murphy. She's done a lot of art for me, and I like art because it's a good way to present scientific facts and data in a very nice way, in an understandable way to a large audience. And she was also a scientist at the University of California, San Francisco, is an artist and a pianist, and now is in Portland. And she, on my request, painted this painting called Origins. And here you've got two fetuses developing in the womb. And you can see they're washed with different colors. And the reason for this is that even though these are identical twins, their environments, even within the same womb, are different. You can ask, well, what possibly could do that? Well, the blood flows to these two individuals most likely are not the same, and that's at least one thing. Therefore, the nutrition that they're receiving is going to be different. And as we'll show later on, very small changes in nutrition of the mother can have profound effects on the epigenome and also have profound effects on the development of disease susceptibility. So what is epigenetics? The simplest definition of it is it just means above the genetics, just like epige uh, epicenter means above the center. And there are two main components of this epigenetic code, and that's methylation groups that are attached directly to the DNA, at, to cytosines. And also, as you all know, the DNA is not just sitting in the nucleus you know, by itself. It's round, wrapped around nucleosomes. And those histones have tails. And they can also be marked with methylation, phosphorylation, those kinds of things, acetylation. And as a consequence, in concert then, what you have is a condensing or opening up of the chromatin structure such that you can program different genes to be functional. So this is how you can have in your body every cell having the same DNA in every cell. You wouldn't be able to tell the DNA if it came from an eye or if it came from your toe by sequencing the genome. But you could definitely tell the difference between a skin cell and an eye cell by looking at its epigenome. So in effect, then, a cell is a programmable computer. And the analogy that I like to use, because it's easy to understand, is that basically the genome, then, is comparable to the hardware, this physical machine, whereas the epigenome is comparable to the software that's telling that hardware when, where, and how to work. So in effect, you have 260 different computers lined up, every one of them running a different software program. And those programs were established very, very early in development. By the end of the first trimester, all of that game is done. Then the fetus is just getting bigger. So that then becomes the most vulnerable time for the environment to alter the epigenome because it's when it's being laid down. So the definition 
the formal definition of epigenetics is the study of heritable changes in the gene function that occur without a change in the sequence of the DNA. That's nice, but the one that I like the best for a definition is this one. And this definition was stated by an outstanding scientist. And as you can see, she died in 2017. And Denise Barlow is the person who got me into the field of epigenetics. So if any of you ever thought, how did somebody like me ever get in there? This is the person who did that. So she said, epigenetics has always been all the weird and wonderful things that can't be explained by genetics. And she described one of the most weirdest and wonderful things in our genome, and that's how I got into the field of epigenetics. And what she did is identify the very first known genomically imprinted gene, and that was the IGF-2 receptor. I am not going to talk about this because I could talk a whole another hour about this subject, and it's actually what we're working on mainly over at NC State right now. <clears throat> but what it is is a phenomena where normally when you inherit one copy from the mom and one from the dad and the autosomal genes, when they're functional, both of them work. Whereas with imprinted genes, you inherit one from the mother and one from the father, but amazingly, only one of them is functional. And it's always the one that's inherited either from the mother or from the father, depending upon the gene at which you're looking at. So the IGF-2 receptor, in mice now at least, is expressed only from the copy that's inherited from the mom. And right at the time that that was identified to be an imprinted gene, the very first, we identified the IGF-2 receptor in humans to be a potent tumor suppressor gene. I was astonished and astounded. How could Mother Nature and why would Mother Nature turn off one copy of something that was that awful important in tumor formation? And I went back to the laboratory and I said, we're moving our whole lab into the field of epigenetics. This is huge and hugely important. But the problem is I didn't have any idea how I was going to do that. But I knew we were going to do it. So that's how I got into the field of epigenetics. Now, this is kind of a long way of saying how we finally got into using the agouti mouse system that I'm going to be talking about later on. <coughs> There's a lot of evidence in the animal data and also epidemiological data for the, what's called the fetal origins of adult disease susceptibility. And it's also referred to in the literature, the early literature anyway, as the Barker hypothesis. The reason for this is he was the very first epidemiologist to study the people that went through the Dutch winter famine right at the end of World War II. And during that famine, the Nazis put an embargo on Holland and they were eating tulip bulbs and sawdust, literally, at that time. And their calories that they were taking in on the average was around 700. To give you some perspective, an adult male should be taking in around 2,000 to 2,200 calories a day. They were starving to death. In one of the coldest winters during the war, 16,000 people died, but some people made it through. And some people not only made it through, but became pregnant. And interestingly then, when he started following the offspring of the people, the women that were in this environment, the starvation environment in Holland at that time, 20 and 30 years later, he found that there was first, they found a significant increase in cardiovascular disease, then obesity, diabetes, and interestingly also, and ultimately a doubling to tripling of the incidence of schizophrenia. Now, I call these natural experiments. These are things, times, and places you would never want to be in, but they are, they do sometimes provide very interesting scientific information. Unfortunately, this natural experiment was replicated in, during the Chinese famine in the late 50s and early 60s, and again, basically, they found the same thing that they found epidemiologically in the Dutch winter famine people. 
But I like this cartoon. It's one of my favorites. Then a miracle occurs right here. Even though we know that exposure or lack of exposure to food or lack of food here very early in development results ultimately in a significant increase in disease susceptibilities, the chronic diseases, in adulthood. The, the glue or the memory system that linked these two disparate periods of time was not known. And as a consequence, many people, in, scientists, basically thought this was BS and kind of like shoved it under the rug and didn't think about it as being anything uh, very serious. Until 2003, when Rob Waterlin, who was a postdoc in my laboratory, did a study with the Agouti mouse, and he demonstrated very clearly that that miracle, at least in these mouse models, involved epigenetic modifications. Interestingly, last year in 2018, again working with the Dutch famine people, that has now also been shown to occur in humans. What is that? 15 years later. So E.O. Wilson, who is a behaviorist at, in Harvard, wrote, for every problem in a given discipline of science, there exists a species ideal for its solution. And for looking at the role of epigenetics in, in adult disease susceptibilities, the ideal model system is the agouti mouse. These are the agouti sisters. I call them that. They're identical age. They're both 100 years, 100 years, 100 days old. <laughs> that would be one hell of an old animal, wouldn't it? <laughs> and they're both uh, female. And they are genetically identical because they're inbred. So the only difference between these animals is what the mother ate while they were in utero. The obese yellow animal, got nor the, mom the mother ate normal chow. And the brown animal, the mother ate chow that was supplemented with methyl donors. These are choline, betaine, vitamin B12, folic acid. So I always say, and Nancy, my wife says, she's in, she said you shouldn't say that, but I do anyway. I say, if you look at this, knowing that these are genetically identical and they have this difference of phenotype and don't appreciate the importance of epigenetics in the adult disease susceptibility, there really is no hope for you. <laughs> there is really no better example of it because you can visually see it. Now, we didn't discover this system, we just used it. So I'm going to go through briefly how this works. Normal, the, normally the agouti gene is switched on only at the end of the hair shaft development. So you have a black hair shaft, then the agouti gene is turned on, and it puts a yellow band at the base of the yellow, black hair shaft, and we now see it as brown or agouti. But in these animals, which is the viable yellow agouti locus animals, the viable yellow, uh, viable yellow agouti mice, it's a strain of mice, a transposable element jumped in upstream of the agouti gene and it usurped basically the regulation, the normal developmental regulation of the agouti gene. And so there's an alternative start site right here and the IAP is transcribed in this direction. <clears throat> so if this area, this virus is basically methylated then you go back to normal developmental regulation and you get what's called a pseudo agouti animal, which is a nice small brown mouse. Whereas if the decision is made not to methylate early in development, really early in development, then what you have is the agouti gene is inappropriately turned on throughout the animal throughout its whole life. And this results in not only a change in the coat color which, to yellow, it's a complete yellow animal, but it also alters its metabolism because the agouti gene is inappropriately expressed in the satiation center of the brain. And as a consequence, it blocks basically the animal's ability to know that it's full. And it literally eats itself into obesity, diabetes, and cancer. This is the model. So now we have a model system with a phenotypic 
readouts to assess what effect any environmental exposure is going to have on that very early develop developmental stage of development. So Rob then, he's a nutritionist, he was a real nutritionist from Cornell, was interested in looking at the role of supplements, particularly the supplements that donate methyl groups. So when he had animals on control diets, this is the distribution of animals that we had. Most of the animals were what I would call either yellow or slightly mottled, and there were fewer over here that were totally brown or heavily mottled. The modeling occurs because that decision point occurs later in development, so you get almost like a calico cat appearance. But it doesn't take much agouti, as you can see, to make these animals obese because even the heavily modeled animals are significantly heavier than the brown, the ones that are completely brown. So then he decided to supplement the, mo the mother's diet with methyl donors. And lo and behold, what he showed is a very clear shifting of that coat color distribution towards having many more animals that were over here rather than over here, looking at the brown versus the yellow. Now that was nice, but what was most important is this. He then looked at the CPG sites in this IAP, and there's I think seven or so of them, and looked at the percent of the cells basically that are methylated as a function of, of each one of these uh, CPG sites for con animals where the mothers were, for offspring where the mothers were on control diet or offspring where the mothers were on diets that were supplemented with choline, betaine, uh, vitamin B12, and folic acid. And I think even the untrained, each dot here, there's about 100 animals in each. Each dot represents an offspring. And as I said, even the untrained eye without statistics, I think you can see very clearly that in the control animals, uh, control diets, most of the animals are yellow or slightly mottled, which is what we see here. And the methylation is very low. Whereas when we supplement the diets, you can see there's much more heavy methylation in this region indicating that this thing is turned off and now you're going towards brown. So for the very first time, what we demonstrated is that what occurred very early in development, i.e. Feed, just feeding the animals a supplement of methyl donors, was able to alter the phenotype and disease susceptibility in adulthood through modifications of the epigenome. This was transforming the way we think about disease susceptibility. Before the study was done, I can tell you, if you read, you can go back and look at the literature of the fetal origins, the literature, the epi word epigenetics, DNA methylation, never showed up, never. After this paper is published, there's not a paper anymore that says that this is not due to epigenetic modifications. So in a control diet, you basically have sort of a normal distribution of yellow and brown on both ends with a lot of model ones in between. Then when you add, as I said, methyl donors like Rob did, it shoves that distribution over so that you have many more brown animals. And it's one distribution, so you also have fewer yellow animals. Then Dana Dolanoy came to the laboratory as a graduate student, and she, we knew that there was evidence that Soya in the diet of Asians basically would potentially look like it was reducing the incidence of cancer. One of the active ingredients in soy is genistein. And we looked and added genistein now to the diet and asked whether genistein could even alter the epigenome in this model system. Now, genistein is interesting because not only is it, a, uh, is it potentially involved in reducing cancer and things, but also it doesn't have a methyl group. So when we found that it also shifted the coat distribution towards brown, it was quite amazing because it demonstrated for the first time that other compounds can do this. Even though they don't have methyl groups, they can alter the epigenome too. But to this day, we still don't know the signal transduction pathway between genistein exposure and the machinery that lays down the DNA methylation and the histone marks. That has not been determined, and it needs to be determined 
people that are excellent, for example, and really love biochemistry, which I am not one, uh, need to go and look at this. Then we looked at an endocrine disrupting agent, which has been, was in the past anyway, was used to make these plastic bottles, which was bisphenol A. <clears throat> and Dana then demonstrated at levels that are present in our bodies that, that in that model system, it generated many, many more yellow animals. Now in this system, that's bad. So these animals get obese, get diabetes and cancer. So now if you look at this curve and this curve, as I said, it doesn't take a rocket scientist very long to think, what would happen if you had the mother exposed to bisphenol, a, a, a toxicant basically in our environment? And then we expose the animals, either the methyl donors or genistein. Could we negate this negative effect that was induced by the endocrine disruptor bisphenol A? And indeed, when she did that, the, control, uh, the curve came right back to what you see in controls. It had completely eliminated the negative effect. So as Hippocrates said two millennium ago, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. It's very clear, at least for diseases that are, that are caused by changes in the epigenome, food is medicine. Now, we were very excited. We submitted this PNAS, and they accepted it for publication. So I had Colin Murphy do another one of her beautiful paintings. I love this painting. So here you have bottles, plastic bottles, dumping bisphenol A on the developing embryo in the womb and counteracting, isn't this beautiful? Counteracting is vegetables that the mother is eating. <laughs> this, I thought this was great and would be the cover of this journal. They loved it so much they decided not to use it. <laughs> but it's still a great painting. So this is where we were until oh, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, ten years ago now, with this study using the agouti mice. Methyl donors increases methylation, genistein increases methylation, ethanol, ethanol also increases methylation. Bisphenol A decreases methylation, which in this system is bad, and in vitro culturing of embryos, like in, for in vitro fertilization, uh, again, only this has only been done in mice, uh, cause hypomethylation to occur at the uh, um, agouti locus. Now, every one of these studies was done with a chemical, and they were all done at a single dose. <coughs> my background, I got my undergraduate degree not in biology like most of you probably have, and this is, this is important for the young students, too, to know that you don't necessarily know where your life and career is going to go from when you were in high school, let alone in college. Okay. I got my under, undergraduate degree in nuclear engineering with a strong emphasis in computer programming. And I was licensed to run this reactor in Madison, Wisconsin by the then Atomic Energy Commission. It's a long ways from running a reactor in Madison to giving this talk on epigenetics. So you never know where your career is going to take you. You can only really determine that, as Steve Jobs said, by looking backwards and connecting the dots. So in a way, that's what I'm doing here today with you. So I'm going to now talk about ionizing radiation because we knew that chemicals could alter the epigenome, but I was interested in whether physical agents might also be able to alter the epigenome during early development. And so we used low doses of ionizing radiation. So this is electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum for radiation going all the way from what do we got, radio waves up to cosmic. And you don't get into what's called ionizing radiation until you get up here with X-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays. And the reason they're called ionizing radiation is because there's enough energy per photon to cause a, a chemical bond break in ionization. And when you get down to lower energies, that can occur. <coughs> so we then looked at, we used the, the, the energy basically that's used for diagnostic radiology right in this region here for these studies. Now, this is a little more 
radiation biology than maybe most of you have ever had, and maybe some of you maybe didn't want to ever know, but it's important to understand why we did the studies that I'm going to describe. So you can, radiation can interact with all organic molecules, including DNA, through two, di two sort of mechanisms, through what's called direct action. Photon comes in, knocks an electron out, which then causes the ionizations, and or it could even directly interact with the DNA and break, uh, uh, cause single or double strand breaks or mutations. But that's direct. The indirect is through basically the creation of free radicals where it interacts with water and busts up the water. Then the reactive oxygen species, in this case an OH free radical, migrates over to the DNA and causes its damage. <coughs> Now I've got another question, and this is only for students now. I don't know who the students are. So how would you protect yourself against direct effects of ionizing radiation, the direct ones, not the indirect? Who's a student? How about that guy way back there? Yeah, you. Speak up. Shielding, shielding. Does anybody have any idea how else you might be able? That's correct, by the way. Any another way in which you could protect yourself against the direct effects of ionizing radiation? Anybody else? Run. <laughs> Distance. Correct. So that you can do for the direct. But for the indirect, you can use free radical scavengers, antioxidants, to suck up the free radicals. So that's all I want to say right now about that. 80% of damage in cells is due to basically the generation of free radicals. Only 20% is due to direct damage. So you have the potential of sucking up 80% of the bad things by the use of antioxidants. So the experiments that we did here now with low-dose radiation are a little more complex because all the pregnancies had to be timed because we irradiated always at the same time right at implantation. So the cells we were irradiating because it's at implantation were the embryonic stem cells. We know that because we know when we irradiated. And now I'm going to go over the results that we found. And this is work done by Autumn Bernal, who was the, actually was the last graduate student that I had when I was at Duke University. Very, very interesting stuff, I think. So here you've got doses. So those of you that I think in the old terms of RADs and REMs, now there's centigrades and even sieverts and stuff like this. But to give you an idea where we are, chest x-rays would be right around here, 0.1 centigrade. <coughs> CT scans come in right around 1 to 2 centigrade. And the amount of radiation that a, a worker like myself, when I was running the reactor, can get per year is 5 centigrade or 5 rad or 5 rem. They're the same. That's the dose that we're dealing with. To give you an idea, when radiation is used to treat cancer, you're talking about 1 to 200 rads per exposure. I mean orders of magnitude higher doses of radiation than what we're talking about here. Background radiation would be right around in here, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And what I've done is I've only plotted the brown and the yellow. So those are the two extremes of that normal distribution. And you can see which direction it's moving by whether you get more or less of the yellow and the brown animals. So the model system now used for risk assessment for radiation and also, by the way, for chemicals is the linear no-threshold model. The linear no-threshold model states absolutely that there is no safe dose of ionizing radiation. It's just that the risk goes down. So, you know, I mean, that's what I was taught. I got my degree, my Ph.D. in radiation biology. And that's what, so we made a hypothesis. What we were going to see with low doses in a dose response, mo dose response model manner was a significant increase in the yellow animals with a concomitant decrease in the brown because that's the badness that you see in this system. Hmm? That's what we said. So 
Autumn started doing an experiment. I never heard anything from her. It was like she disappeared. Finally, I went up and I, said, I sat in her office and I said, Autumn, I said, how's the experiment going? And this is her exact quote. She said, it's really freaky. <laughs> now, it's not good when your student tells you that your experiment is freaky. Here's what she saw. With dose, the level and incidence of yellow animals went down to zero. And concomitant with this, which is what you would expect because it's one distribution, the level of brown animals in this model system went significantly up to the point at where you're at one centigrade, which is what you get for the CT scan, there were 15 times as many brown animals and heavily modeled animals as there were the yellow animals. This is what was freaky, because this is not what we predicted. Now, I won't exactly say what I said <laughs> when I heard this, because there has been something out there for as long as I can remember, because I heard it when I was in graduate school, but I thought it was absolutely, totally BS. And that's the phenomena of hormesis. And we'll get back to that later on. So I said, we're in the middle of this autumn. I said, nobody's gonna like these results. And nobody likes hormesis. They all like linear no threshold. We're gonna get this paper published. Well, we did get it published with a little bit of effort. So with radiation doses, you gradually shifted this curve from a standard normal distribution to way over into the brown, to the point where, there, at least with the number of animals we had, we basically had no yellow animals at all. And as you would, I know, now expect, this was absolutely correlated with the degree of methylation. The more brown animals, the heavier the methylation, and then it started coming down. You can see this. It's amazing. It goes up, and it's starting to come down. It's going up, and it's coming back. It's amazing. So here's the results. The low doses of ionizing radiation increase the incidence of brown offspring by enhancing DNA methylation in this model system. Thus, low doses of x-rays induce positive adaptive responses in these mice by altering the epigenome. Not negative, positive. So then we said, okay, now we get back to the antioxidants. Since 80% of the damage is due to free radical formation, we should be able to suck these up and alter, alter this response. We didn't know which way because I was still thinking maybe what we were seeing was not right. But if it was right, antioxidants would now turn up to be bad. This is, this is great. I mean, you can see how much fun I had getting this paper published. So we did the study. So here you've got, again, yellow and brown at the control, and the ratio is this little dot. So there's the ratio is basically one. There's about as many brown as a yellow because it's a normal distribution, pretty much, of offspring coat colors. Then we irradiated with 3 centigrade, which is right up at the, the, the biggest positive effect that we saw. And lo and behold, we had 15 times as many brown animals as we had yellow. And when we add antioxidants to this whole thing, oh, it was so good. It went right back to control. The ratio is now 1 again. So we totally negated the we totally negated the positive adaptive response induced by low doses of ionizing radiation with the addition of vitamin E and vitamin C and other antioxidants. If you look at methylation, it's exactly what you would expect. It goes up, normal, and when you get add the antioxidants to it, then you go right back down to controls. So the conclusions of this study are Antioxidants negate the increased DNA methylation and block the positive adaptive response induced by low doses of x-rays. And the positive adaptive response induced by low doses of x-rays is mediated in part through the generation of reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. 
this is where we are right now. In 1896, Rankin discovered x-rays, and very soon thereafter, one of the very first x-rays was taken of his wife's hand. Notice he did not use his hand. <laughs> that is a female ring. And as I said, the risk assessment model that's now used for ionizing radiation and also for chemicals is the linear no threshold model, which means that there is no dose of radiation or chemicals, basically toxicants that's safe. But yet, when we did, at least at this locus and even a couple of other ones that we looked at, we found that not only is this not correct, but we actually saw positive adaptive responses. In other words, if you look at yellow obese mice, as you increase in dose, the numbers of those animals goes down. And as I said, you remember it started shifting back? We don't know where it crosses the abscissa, but it's going to be somewhere around 10 centigrade. And then it goes up and it's toxic, like we all know radiation is at high doses. This is more compatible with the hormetic risk assessment model than it is with the linear no threshold model. And obviously, a lot more research has to be done in this area. But the mechanism for hormesis, like the mechanism for the fetal origins of adult disease susceptibility, is alterations in the epigenome, not changes in the genome. And when you forget that there's two things going on in this programmable computer, both the hardware and the software, you miss at least half of what's going on. So questions in that, I think, need to be addressed right now. Do other... Uh, I can't read this somewhere. Frequencies of electromagnetic radiation high energy particles also alter the epigenome. What is the signal tr transduction pathway that links basically the formation of reactive oxygen species and the laying down of the epigenome? That we don't know. Do radiation, low doses of radiation, alter the human epigenome? We have no clue. And is the linear no threshold model potentially not applicable? It's not appropriate. And for those of you who say, well, I'm not really interested in radiation, as I said, chemicals are the same, and there's a lot of evidence for hormesis with chemicals also at low doses. So I think this has got to be really seriously revisited, and revisited not from the standpoint of epidemiology like we've done forever and ever and ever, amen, but actually looking at mechanisms that are potentially involved in this, which I can guarantee involve epigenetic dysregulation and changes. That's where you look. We now know where to look, and it has to be done. And we have to do this, why? For radiation, for example, if we could optimize and stabilize this response, we might be able to protect, for example, astronauts as they go into space. Rather than arguing about whether hormesis exists or not, it does exist, and we know how it exists now. We need to try to use it to our advantage, and also maybe get better risk assessments than we've been able to do thus far. Now, I'm not a bona fide toxicologist, so I can say this, and I'm also retired, kind of, so I can get away with this. But these are things that need to be looked at. So summary. We have now shown that the exposure of offspring to both physical and chemical agents while in the womb can alter their adult disease susceptibility by modifying the epigenome. It's pretty humbling to be able to take 15 years or 20 years of research and condense it down into a single statement. <laughs> but being able to say this statement with certainty has changed the way we look at adult disease susceptibility forever. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll just take two quick questions. I think there was one right here. Uh, you had a slide that showed IVF produced a more yellow, presumably obese mice. Can you, is that correct? And what are the implications for human use of IVF? Well, it hasn't been done in humans. These kinds of studies have not been done in humans, but they're... Sorry, oh. you need to take that one. <laughs> it's consistent what we've also found with um, cloning 
in large offspring syndrome that occurred, you know, these studies were done probably now maybe 10, 15 years ago. Large offspring sy syndrome is basically caused by the loss of methylation that's required to maintain the maternal allele of IGF-2R open. And that cloning process knocks those off, and that's the mechanism for large offspring syndrome. Now, interestingly, at least from the IGF-2R story, we do not have this gene imprinted. It, imprinting also varies with species. But it suggests that, that these kinds of things potentially can be occurring, and maybe we have not optimized uh, the medium that's uh, being used for in vitro fertilization from the standpoint of maintaining uh, the epigenome. Whether people can or will do that, I, I don't know because I'm not in that. But I think it's something that uh, we probably should be looking at because in vitro fertilization does increase the incidence of a number of developmental disorders that are caused by dysregulation of, of genomic imprinting. We're just going to take this one here and then I'll ask Dr. Dribble to stay after. <coughs> Randy, I have a quick comment and a question. Having worked at EPA, the linear model is used because otherwise people would be selling stuff, you know, X-ray machines to irradiate yourself and things like that. That's one of the concerns I've been told. That the hormesis, hormesis is a bad word at the EPA. Okay, so that's a, uh, first. The second thing, I just um, ran all the way up here to ask you one question. What status of erasure and green printing is that? You know, multi-generational effect, is that proved or is it still there? The Dutch famine, for example. I think there's some evidence on that now, but I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't get into the transgenerational. A lot of people are very interested in whether these marks are transferred from generation to generation. My guess is that, in, that it does to some degree. Uh, it surely does in lower animals. It's very clear in Drosophila, nematodes, plants, that kind of stuff that these epigenetic uh, changes survive 14, 15 generations. Now, in ma mammals, it's much more difficult to do these experiments. And just because some, the EPA doesn't like something doesn't mean that it's not correct. <laughs> and I don't really, I actually really don't like that comment because this is the reason why I actually thought we would probably have a lot of problems getting this paper in, in press because people are not open to changing of their ideas of how things occur. Hormesis is there, and it's due to changes not in the genome and mutations in the genome, it's due to changes in the epigenome. And the biological systems are counteracting the potential negative effects that the compounds are doing to the genome itself. And if you want to think about this, I'll go with another example. BRCA1 and BRCA2, 80% of women with these get 80% get tumor, get, you know, get cancer. High penetrance, 20% don't. How does that work? My guess is that they're modifying genes either through mutations or through expression changes that totally negate the negative effects of these mutations. And that's what we're seeing here. All right, listen, I'm sorry we have to cut this off, but I'll ask Dr. Dirtle to stay after. Thank you so much.